Hi, my name is Holly. I'm a program manager at Edison Ford Winter Estates. And here I am in front of the Miller Edison family. And I'm going to share one of their stories. And this is one that uh, after I started working here about 18 years ago, I heard the story of Theodore Miller and it touched my heart. So I want like to share his story with you. So we'll get started. Theodore Miller, Rough Rider. So that gives you a little hint about what happens to him. And there's a picture of Theodore as a young man. In fact, he was a very young, young man. And here we have Lewis Miller and his wife, Mary Valinda. Lewis was the founder, co-founder of Altman Miller and Company and the inventor of the Buckeye Mower and Reaper, which is a big deal at the time. And he had gone into this business with his stepbrother. He didn't start out wealthy, but he earned a lot of money um, and came um, also a benefactor, a philanthropist, and he was a person that had a number of patents, and he was also the co-founder of Chautauqua Institute in upstate New York. This is his wife, Mary Valinda, and I don't want to minimalize her influence. Um, she's a mother of 11. She was a kind and giving person, uh, and they were both very uh, wonderful, kind, generous people. And I think the biggest thing that he does is he co-founds Chautauqua in upstate New York, which isn't just a place that you can go today. It, at the time, it was for Sunday school teachers, but it expanded to all educational things in the summer. And over the years, it's expanded their focus. It's a very well-known place. And there were Chautauqua movements um, going across the country. It became a very, very well-known place. And so he has a long-lasting impact beyond his inventions, which you probably hadn't heard of today, in that he did something that changed the world. And so did Mary Valinda, because she was the mother of all those children, some wonderful human beings. This is Oak Place, where the Miller family lived. Um, this is the way it looks today on the right. And on the left, that is the way it might have looked during the time. Uh, that's not the best picture. You know, photography wasn't as good then, but it was actually a beautiful home. They didn't originally live in there, up and had 30 acres, I believe, around it at the time. It was on a bluff. It overlooked Akron, Ohio, which is where he had his business. By the way, Chautauqua will be in upstate New York, but they will go there every summer. When they met and they fell in love and they had children, uh, they will have 11 children. Theodore Westwood Miller was born in Akron, Ohio, the 11th child of Lewis and Mary Valinda Miller on July 1st, 1875. His brother John was a year older, so there's Theodore there. So he's one of 11 children. And one that you probably have heard of is Mina Miller Edison, number seven of 11, because she will live here in Fort Myers, and Theodore was her beloved brother. Theodore was loved by everyone and considered to be a golden child, a giving, kind, thoughtful, generous, intelligent young man. Here's a little picture of the Miller Cottage in Chautauqua. And I believe it's now um, owned by the Institute, but it falls under maybe the National Park Service. I know it's a National Historic Register. Um, descendants of Minas sold it to them. So it is preserved. And what's interesting here is on downstairs here would be one bedroom from the parents, a tiny kitchen, a living area. I hope I'm getting this all right. Up here, the girls would have a bedroom. And over here, the boys would stay during the summer. And some very famous people, I believe it was President Grant even slept in this tent for a nap. So it was a quite a well-known place in Chautauqua. And, uh, was quite beloved by the Miller family. And Theodore would spend a lot of time there. And there's, um, Theodore, I don't believe is actually in this picture, but there's some Edisons and some Millers in this picture. Here's a picture with Theodore and John, Theodore and John, and some friends. And this is the picture that I'm standing in front of. And I just wanted to point out some people so that you would know who I'm talking about. And this is Thomas Edison, 
This is John. He's only one year older than Theodore. They are best friends. This is another brother, Ira, wife, Cora. This is Grace Miller. She, I'm one of the Miller children. Uh, this is Marion Edison Oser. Uh, she had married a German soldier. This is Thomas Edison's daughter, first marriage. Other Edison family members, um, and we'll go down here so that we can find Theodore Edison right there. So a bunch of Edison's, Charles's little baby over here on his mother's lap. That's Lewis Miller and Mary. So you get an idea of the family that's here. Theodore showed in 18, this is a picture from 1892, and Theodore showed a fondness for music, which grew throughout his life. And we'll, and we'll get to his Rough Rider stage, but I kind of wanted to let you know what kind of person he was. At 12, he began to play the violin. He played the orchestra in Sunday school. In high school, he organized a string quartet and an orchestra. He sang, he wrote music, he conducted what, he did everything. He also became a great orator in high school and graduated at 16. And following graduation from high school, John and Theodore attended St. Paul's School in Concord, New Hampshire, that still exists today. To complete their prep for Yale. So they're going to go there for two years. And this is a picture of Theodore and John outside of Oak Place, their home. Photography was not the best at that time. Picture of the family again here. And here, following high school graduation, Theodore and John entered St. Paul's School in Concord, New Hampshire to prepare them to attend Yale. I'm sure that's on, excuse me. Uh, Theodore and John found their place in the social system of St. Paul's. And this, they were added by their friend, Dale Goodridge. Goodridge Tires from Akron, Ohio. His name was uh, actually David, but they called him Dave, who preceded them there. After two years at St. Paul's, Theodore was admitted to Yale. He entered into the life of the school with great enthusiasm in sports. And he was also an ardent member of the School Missionary Society. He, en he entered in the school life with great enthusiasm, sports and choir, as I mentioned, the Missionary Society. And he will graduate from Yale in 1897. And he did so many things and he was so popular and so beloved by his classmates. The two brothers were close companions, just a year apart in age. At Chautauqua, where he spent part of every summer, Theodore maintained his friendships of his childhood, and he was very a leader in the social life. And I guess I should point out the one on the left is Theodore, and the one on the right is John. And that's their nephew, um, Lewis Miller II, I believe. So in 1897, he was on the crew team, what we would call rowing. That's Theodore down on the left. And here they are, he's a substitute in Yale football. He entered into the life of Yale um, with great enthusiasm. And he would go back even to visit his sister in New Jersey from there from time to time. In the fall of 1897, he had, enters New York Law School. He has roommates. He doesn't have anything fancy for an apartment. He got a job as a clerk in the office of a prominent legal firm. And John, who wished to be a mechanical engineer, entered graduate school at Cornell. Uh, so he's in upstate New York. Um, this was the first extended separation and they both felt it. But Theodore would go and visit his sister Minor because she, she didn't live very far from New York City in New Jersey in Glenmont. What happens, and this is what happens, I don't mean to make it a sweeping generalization, and I will say at the time for young men, because at that time, a lot of young women went to war unless they pretended to be a male or they went as a nurse. Um, so what happened, the Spanish-American War, and I'm far from an expert on the Spanish-American War, but my husband helped, gave me some books. I asked him some questions, did a little reading, and what I remembered from history myself, um, the Monroe Doctrine, which meant that Europe was not supposed to be colonizing other countries over in our neck of the woods. Um, 
And guess what? <laughs> that was happening in Cuba because Spain was colonizing it. Over there, they were in control. And they can use that Monroe Doctrine to, to their advantage. And there was an uprising and Cubans uh, were trying to uh, win their independence and be free from Spain. Teddy Roosevelt was um, no, knew of the upheaval there. And he also desperately wanted to go to war. I, I, I'm trying to express that correctly, but yes, he was a big proponent of having a war. And then there was yellow journalism, people like Pulitzer and Hearst. Um, and some people say, no, that wasn't really an influence, but I believe the newspapers reported things all the time that got US citizens very upset, thinking that we should enter the war. Um, and they want, the U.S. said it supported Cuba's independence. We had business interests there. And most importantly, I think, the sinking of the USS Maine, which was at, in the harbor there when it exploded. The problem with this, it, and of course they said it was the Spanish that did it, but I don't think there is any absolute proof and there might've just been something terrible that happened. <laughs> something exploded on the ship, which is more likely it really wasn't the Spanish. But that, if you've ever heard, remember the Maine, because that was the name of that ship, that got people going. What was Teddy Roosevelt doing at this point? And why is he even important? Well, he's going to be one of the founders, co-founders of the Rough Riders. At that point, he was assistant secretary of the Navy. And now we're going to go into war because McKinley is convinced because of the Monroe Doctrine because of public pressure, because of whatever, that we need to get out there. And then the war is not just going to be fought in Cuba. There'll be Puerto Rico and the Philippines, obviously. Um, I'll leave it to you to realize what happens later. Well, maybe we'll talk about that a little bit. But he is going to resign. And Leonard Wood becomes colonel of this group called the Rough Riders. And Roosevelt turned down the colonelcy. He was going to be the lieutenant colonel. And they recruited and organized the first U.S. Volunteer Cavalry, uh, and they were called the Rough Riders. But it's going to become Teddy's show very quickly. There were 23,000 applications going through to form the regiment. Roosevelt's fame and leadership, and I mean, he was a leader for sure, turned him into the de facto leader, and even when he wasn't. But by the time they're in Cuba and they're in battle, he is the colonel, um, into de facto leader of a group of polo players, hunters, Cowboys, Native Americans, and athletic college buddies, very wealthy. Um, a mixed group, more mixed group you'd never find. And there he is. So now we're going to go to war. It's going to be a short war, but it will have an impact. Here's Theodore, and this is what he says to his mother. I hope you will believe me. And this is going to sound very flowery, but realize this is a well over a hundred years ago, people wrote differently. He's the baby of his family and he's very devoted to his mother. I love you most of all, when I say that I love you most of all, I will give you almost anything to be there at home now to kiss you and talk this over with you. It is very hard, hard to argue a question of this sort. And I can't say anything in contradiction to your desire for me to stay. For I would stay if I thought it was my duty not to go. There are lots of men who could go without missing much work, but there are very few who could go without leaving some loving friends behind. If everybody excused himself for selfish reasons, we could have no army. Patriotism must control and love of country prevail. And this is a letter from Theodore to his mother, April 26, 1898. Second letter. Then there's a recruiting poster. My darling mother, so he's not, not drafted, he's volunteering. The second call has been made and I should answer it. There could be no better place than where I'm going for this regiment. It is made up of the finest fellows in the country and I have several friends with it. Dave Goodridge, David Goodridge, was mighty good to find the opening for me and I'll tell you how that happened in a minute. And I owe him a great deal. He is a fine fellow and are knowing each other so well it will be great satisfaction to both of us and to you people at home. I told Mr. Marvin I was gonna enlist someplace. He suggested I go with the Rough Riders Regiment. So we telegraphed Dade to find out and Dade was a Lieutenant with 
the Rough Riders, if there was any opening, he answered the next morning, come immediately, have place for you here at once. I wish I could stop off to see you in Akron. That is impossible without losing a whole day. And I'm afraid that would make me too late. It would be very unsatisfactory for us to see each other just a moment. And now we will not have to say goodbye and endure the sorrow parting. I want to bet that she would have loved to even just have a second. Darling, I think I'm doing my duty and trust that you will agree with me. My train leaves right away. So I must close, darling. Love you. Love beyond expression from a loving son, Theodore. And he does say goodbye at the end. And what happened here? Lewis Miller, um, you know, it wasn't, he understood Theodore's desire to go to war. And one place I read that he had never gone to the Civil War. So he wanted to support his son. I, I'm not sure if that's true or not, but that wasn't uncommon that men that didn't go wanted their sons to go. Of course, there are those that went that wanted their sons to go. Um, but he is going to use his influence to get him an officer's position. And Theodore didn't want that. He wanted to be, what I want to do is to get into the scrap and be able to do something worth doing, he said to his fam father. I may be too eager and ambitious, but that is what I want to do. And then he had another possible position from a regiment from New York, but it would have been a clerk's position. And that is also not what he wanted. His friend from Akron had signed on with uh, that regiment organized by Theodore Roosevelt. And I told you all the people, they were also miners. They were some really rough and tumble guys and from out West and Roosevelt's Eastern friends, well-educated, socially connected. And they become known as the Rough Riders and they had headed down to Texas. So Goodrich telegraphs Miller to join the group in San Antonio. And he will end up going there with his father and they miss him. The Rough Riders were there because they're coming together from all over the place. Um, and they're headed to Tampa, Florida. So what happens is they eventually catch up with him, them in New Orleans. And then from there, they're going to head to Tampa. From the start, and here's a little more, Theodore wanted to enlist and Lewis preferred that John and Theodore have an office job that would go into combat. That's why I said I had some conflicting information here. His mother didn't want them to go at all. Absolutely not her boys. And I understand that. Theodore wanted action. John is going to join the Navy and he's stationed in Guantanamo Bay. And he will become an ensign eventually. But Theodore, when he knew his friend had an opening, he went to Texas They and they end up catching up in New Orleans. They train. And this is when they say they trained, they had very little training, but they maintained high spirits on this trip from uh, New Orleans. It wasn't really New Orleans. It goes from Tampa uh, to Cuba, despite the scarce and frequently rotten food. And they land on June 22nd in Cuba, where the first couple of days, and this is what's really interesting because Theodore keeps a diary that his family will eventually get. And he talks about the boredom and just the drudgery, you know, the weather, all those things the first couple of days, but then they're in a battle. And I'm not gonna pronounce this right. I'm gonna try though, the battle of Las Guasmas. And this is his friend, Hamilton Fish from New York. His uncle was a very well-known secretary of state. His father was a banker, prominent family. So two days later, they're in this battle where some of his fellow soldiers were killed. And that's where Hamilton Fish, young man from a very wealthy family in New York, died, was killed. All types of people from all types of backgrounds died and all of their deaths were a tragedy. And Theodore is also writes about taking care of another person named Teddy. Some people got very, very ill with high fevers from disease. And my, my husband and I were talking about this. How many people died from disease in many different wars and battles? And that is just as tragic. I'm so, sometimes it's hard for me to even talk about this. I just feel really emotional. I feel like I know Theodore. Um, so let me tell you what happens here. 
you've heard of the Battle of San Juan Hill, which was actually Kettle Hill. And there's, um, but this is what, and it's in Santiago. Some people call it the Battle of Santiago. They're ready to go into battle again a few days later. And the last entry in Theodore's diary was made as he stood in line, awaiting the advance against the outposts of Santiago. Santiago. American field artillery had begun to bombard the trenches in front of the city. The Spaniards replied, and a large shell exploded over the heads of the Rough Riders. For a while, they were told to protect themselves over the crest of the hill, but the advance was ordered, and the command made a detour of a mile and a half. And, and I know there, anybody that you're going to see on horseback in this picture, they're an officer. The men, the, the enlisted men, everybody that's not an officer is walking. They cross the stream. They left behind their backpacks. They go in over an open field. Through this, they made their way by a series of rushes until they gained the protection of a stream, which had cut its course between steep banks. And the men are standing in knee-deep water while bullets are flying all around them. And shrapnel is bursting. And after a half an hour trying experience, the troops were ordered into an adjoining field. And again, they pushed on towards the enemy. And they were arrived in time to take part in charge of a blockhouse of which the Americans had gained possession. And this is what Lieutenant Goodridge says from this vantage point, they fired into the trenches of a second position which the enemy had taken near a blockhouse. Lieutenant Goodridge at this time lay down in the firing line report and reported that Theodore was enjoying himself immensely. And said it's, and um, I, we have to take his word for it that that's what you know, he believed was happening. But after a brief rest, the troops were again ordered to advance. And this is, um, this is the famous charge here. And just as they're about to reach the protection of a rise of ground, a volley from the Spanish Mausers, their weapons, was poured into their line. Five men dropped almost at the same instant, and among them was Theodore Miller. Love, another soldier, was near him called, Miller, I will come to you in a minute. That's all right, love, don't bother about me. And this is from his diary. But other, you know, other people's story is put in his diary as well, was the response. Holt, another comrade, made, remained with his wounded friend who whispered, and this is Theodore saying this, I'm going, Harry, but it's in a good cause, isn't it? So if you want to read Theodore Miller's diary, there's his diary, um, there's his um, eulogy, given by Reverend Vincent, the co-founder of Chautauqua. And there are stories from his companions in the war, his comrades, and from people he went to college with. You can buy it on Amazon. I couldn't get it here in time because it's not sold directly by them. But there's a couple of different places it's scanned in. Um, Google Books is fairly good, except there's one page where you don't see any writing, but um, some purple gloves. So I found it in another place, a little harder to read because it's fainter, but it, there's definitely every page you can read. And I would say it's well worth reading the whole story because he also gives an overview of his life. And this is a very well-known painting, by the way. Within a short time, what happens is that a Lieutenant Goodridge, there his good friend, came to him. And he's the first exam in the left shoulder was a wound which they didn't think was very serious, but a closer examination revealed the second wound in the right shoulder. It was then evident that the bullet had entered the left shoulder, been deflected by the shoulder blade, had gone through his body and passed out the right shoulder, but it also had damaged his spinal cords. And so he was injured below the shoulders was paralyzed. Theodore was unwilling at first to have his friends remain with them and urged them to go to the front. 
He whispered in the ear of Lieutenant Goodrich that he found it hard to breathe, but that otherwise he felt little pain. Lieutenant directed two men to look after him and they could secure the services of a hospital attendant and they're going to go back and the Lieutenant has to go back to his post of duty. And in a little bit, six privates carried Theodore to the Vision Hospital. They cut uh, two poles and they stretched something in between that. Um, this is what Lieutenant Goodridge tells Mrs. Miller. He writes uh, her a letter. And there's someone else that tells them that this stretcher, which has had a blanket on it, they took him to the recently captured blockhouse, which had already been turned into a hospital. Here, Theodore's wound was dressed, and then the journey to the rear was resumed. And the field hospital was five miles away from the front, and that they halted halfway at a temporary, another temporary hospital where they dressed the wound for a second time. During all the journey, um, he was worried about the young men and this is also from that book about him that includes his diary. He kept saying, fellows, this is mighty good of you. I'm afraid I'm tiring you out. What an unselfish young man. He was worried about others. The field hospital, when they get there five miles away, was planned for 50 wounded, but was overwhelmed by the number of people placed upon it. 400 men were lying without shelter on the ground near hospital tents. The surgeons keep on, kept on looking at them and Theodore's friends found, improvised a bed for him. There weren't even any beds and saw that his wound was dressed again. On the third day, he's taken from there you know, by an ambulance cart to Saboni. There he was put under the charge of the Red Cross Society um, where they had a little hospital from an abandoned building there. And he was immediately under the care of Dr. and Mrs. Lesser of the Red Cross Society and the other nurses of the organization. And some of them will write to his mother. He, um, they, he really did get the best care they had at the time at the location that they had. They, I guess at one point they tried some surgery, but it just, it was futile. Um, people really were very fond of him, especially Mrs. Les Lesser. that she was said to make his last few hours very um, the skilled uh, constant care as nursing could do. She made Teddy, as we called him, for constant and particular care. And here is his last letter I'm gonna read you. And this is Mrs. Lesser. They were um, they're from the Red Cross. Her husband was a doctor. And this is a letter he dictates to someone. My dear mama, I rather narrow escape, but feel I will be all right. Teddy Burke and Mr. Remington have done all that was possible in getting extra things. Mr. Whitney offered to write to you, but Mr. McClure had offered before, so he did so. You must not worry about this thing for Dr. Lesser, who is here just now and is at the head of the Red Cross of America, said I would come out all right soon. And I, I'm guessing he just... I. My guess is he said that to make Theodore feel better. He said he was going to write you himself. They are doing everything they can for me. I remain your most loving son and will be with you soon. Goodbye. On the eighth day, the end came. The day before he had fallen, they put as a stupor, but I would say it was into a coma from which he never fully awakened. It was a little before afternoon that he died. Uh, one of his hospital companions his, that was next to him thus described this scene. He said, I sat by him the next day as long as I could sit up and then lay down on a cot nearby. I was on the sick list myself and fell into a doze. And when I awoke, he had left us. I went up and sat down and took a long look at his face. Around the corners of his mouth were traces of this patient's smile that he had worn so bravely through it all. And he is going to be married, buried that same day. He never regains consciousness after he, and of course he 
comes unconscious, he dies. And the young man told what he observed. And Theodore was buried the same afternoon, about five o'clock. And a headboard was put in place with his name um, marked by Mr. Knox, one of the people caring for him. And later at the suggestion of Lieutenant Goodridge, the grave was further marked by the burying of a bottle when which contained his name and address. That way his body could be identified. Mina and her mother and her sisters were at Glenmont, awaiting the birth of her baby, who was born three days after Theodore Miller's death. And this is an article that appeared in the 80s, and I think the Akron paper. What happens next? And he kind of tells us that. said, um, well, in August, John is going to go to exhume his body. Well, let me tell you a little bit more before I go beyond there. And there's a picture of all the Edison's, Edison's Millers here. And Theodore is in here as well. They just had so much fun together. So these women are waiting for the birth of Mina's baby. Mina goes into labor. Thomas Edison gets a telegram that Theodore Miller has passed away. And he has to decide what to do. Mina's in labor. Her mother is there. Two of her sisters are there. There is no easy answer. What he does is tells his sister. Edison had sent a telegram to his father. So that news spreads. And Mina is in labor and she find, and she gives birth to a little boy and she names him Theodore Miller Edison. She found out a day after she gave birth that Theodore had passed away. And I told you that John was in a, na in a, a Navy at Guantanamo. He goes and his father gets him released so he can go in search of Theodore's body. This whole family is extremely grieved about the death of him. And so John left his Navy post there, exhumed his body, it wasn't easy. He gets a coffin, a casket, and the body is brought to New York and then to Akron, Ohio, and buried in the Glendale Cemetery. So there was much joy and much sadness, a new life and a life, a brilliant life, snuffed out. And this is from, this says Theodore W. Miller. He was a private in Company D. Camp, I can't quite read it, Wick, Wickoff, September 15th, 1898, well after he had passed away, because he dies on July 8th. He en enrolled in 1898, June 4th in Tampa, last place of residence was Akron, and he was wounded before, battle before Santiago, July 1st, 1898, died of effects of wound July 8th, 1898. He is 23 years old. The tragedy had fallen the Miller family that they would never quite recover from. So in Akron, they will know he's dead on 11th of July. Theodore had died on the 8th. He breaks the news to everyone at home. Mary, Mina's sister, sends telegrams to her brothers. You know that John goes to retrieve his body. The family is every place, Louis Jr. and Honolulu. Everybody comes home. Everybody tries to gather together. So imagine this, Mrs. Mrs. Miller, Mary, Two sisters there, they're 
one of them has to tell her that the baby, her, her baby brother had died. It actually takes 30 days for John to get his younger brother's body. Theodore was transferred to that casket I told you about for a long journey home. Three days later, men moved the coffin to a barge. And when the ship passed the place of Theodore's battle, 1,200 men sang the Star Spangled Banner. Then they get to Long Island. And I think I told you they went to New York, but yellow fever broke out so they couldn't get off the ship. They had to quarantine for three more days. And then John's oldest brother, Edward, comes and finds him. And they go back to Akron, and he had returned home. And thousands of theater's friends filled the First Methodist Church as Reverend Vincent gives this talk about him, which is also in that book about with Theodore's diary and about his life. Reverend Vincent glorified the memory of Theodore. Lewis Miller supported his wife. She was distraught, consumed with grief. The children, the Miller children, and there's so there's a big service and they are devout Methodist, and it was Methodist Episcopalian. Um, Theodore's older sister, Jenny, was already such ill health, had many illnesses among them, things to do with her heart valve. And she was ill and she had to stay in her carriage. So everybody's there, everybody's heartbroken, and then they will have a private service in the house. They are going through so much. Thomas Edison did not join his wife. He was busy at his work and did not attend the funeral. It was very hard for those children. They were extremely close. This is something I would like you to um, look at. This was a monument put up. In, in honor of the Spanish-American War. Publishing magnate Paul E. Werner, chief mar marshal of the Akron's Memorial Day's events, proposed constructing a grand triumphal arch two weeks after the U.S. declared war against Spain in April of 1898. Work was built a beautiful neoclassical arch in 1898 as a memorial for U.S. troops in the Spanish-American War. Built in 1898, it's gone four months later. And what does it say beneath the engraved message on the northern side? It says something like, in honor of our nation's heroes. And on the other side, it said, and it's some Latin, I don't speak Latin, but what it means is, if you want peace, prepare for war. It features, it's very elaborate, um, the description of it, it. There was an article in the Akron Beacon in 2008. It said it featured eight Doric co columns, 24 feet high and four feet in diameter. And one of the, our historians, Bailey, said they really, they were false Doric. They're really ionic, in case you wanted to know. And it had a double deck roof. I, I mean, it's got sayings. And there's one side that says, love of my country led me. At the top, there was a sculpture of an American ego, eagle. The street was lit up with incandescent lights of red, white, and blue. There's Chinese Latins. Memorial Day began on May 30th as veterans decorated the graves in Akron. People were marching up and down the street and it was beautiful beyond what anybody in Akron had ever seen before. The 4th of July celebration was even more joyful. Citizens had joyful troops had captured Guam, evaded Cuba, and the end of the war seemed to be near and they celebrated all night. But guess what? Guess where the Millers lived? The Millers lived only a block away from that grand triumphal arch their mansion still stands today, but the monument does not. They were only about a block away. Although the arch was built to last, it didn't last. It disappeared from downtown Akron. And everybody thinks so it was torn down. They think because the grief of a family having to look down upon that every day and think about their son, Theodore, their brothers, Theodore. And by September, it was taken apart. 
so it did not last long. But look at the size of it compared to downtown at the time. And I just thought I'd show you one of the newspaper clippings about Theodore. The, the Sooners were held over the remains of Theodore Miller, the dead rough rider, son of Honorable Lewis Miller. At two o'clock, they were held in the First Methodist Episcopal Church, to which the public was invited. The church was filled with several thousand people, a double quartet. People sp spoke at, and after that, a private service was held at the Miller residence Oak Place, and the body was interred in the family lot at Glendale Cemetery. He had the Grand Army of the Republic, that would be Civil War veterans had charge at the service and the body was buried with military honors. The pallbearers were uh, intimate friends of the deceased Rough Rider from his class at Yale. So the whole city of Akron is grieving here. This is the Miller family plot. Spanish-American War did not last long. Uh, the U.S. did gain Puerto Rico, Guam, and briefly the Philippines. So will go on to be another war there. Cuba, we don't keep. You know what happened to Cuba. It falls to communism in the 1950s. But before that, um, it, its leadership was pretty questionable as well. So we went to a very brief war. I know that in Cuba, not the whole war because it's taking place in other places, 385 men died. One of them was Theodore Miller, 23 years old. And here is this an on, is in on, honor of him as a rough rider. You can see, if I look up here, you can see what's on here, like a medallion. Theodore Westwood Miller, a rough rider, was buried in Akron's Glendale Cemetery. His marker containing the bronze emblem of his regiment, the first volunteer cavalry, AKA the rough riders. And by the way, in that little booklet that you can look at online or print out, there's letters from all kinds of people, including Teddy Roosevelt. And guess what? I found this newspaper article from March. This is what it says. On a recent visit to Miller's grave, or maybe it was a TV station, I, but what it said, Lewis Sodgrass, trustee for the Cuyahoga Falls Historical Society, made a startling discovery the beautiful bronze ornamentation that was anchored to the gravestone. So that's this year that happened, was gone. I thought to myself, who would do such a dastardly thing? Police have been notified, but Snodgrass has a plea. I want to give it, give the person who took this a chance to bring it back. Just bring it back, no questions asked, he says. And, you know, I've looked since then, since I found that article or that TV clipping and nothing says it's been found and i would think it would be almost impossible to find another one unless somebody had the skill to recreate it but even so it wouldn't be the original and it just seems to me to be such a tragedy and yes there are many miller family descendants today and i do hope and pray someone gets a conscience and returns it Um, and this is from that little book that I made a copy of that page about Theodore. At the end, they're fundraising for a gateway at Yale where he attended. And I'll read this from the booklet itself. It said, soon after Theodore's death, it was suggested by several quarters that some memorial should be provided by his Yale's classmates. One plan was to fund a scholarship. But this was abandoned when the idea of elect, erecting a gateway on the Yale campus was proposed by Harry, Henry S. Coff, and the latter suggest appeared more vividly to the imagination of his college friends and seemed more appropriate for Soldier's Monument. A committee was appointed. And so here in the book, they were talking about the fundraising that they were doing for it. And that this here says he fell shot through the lungs in the charge on San Juan Hill on July 1st. The gateway has two panels. That one facing Elm Street bears the inscription in memory of Theodore Miller, 
Westwood Miller, class of 1897, who fell mortally wounded in the charge on San Juan Hill at Santiago de Cuba, 1st of July, 1898, born July 30th, born January 30th, 1875, died July 8th, 1898. Excuse me. Those words ran in together. The other panel turned toward the campus bears a decorative symbol design consisting of a pair of sabers superimposed on the wings of victory. Above the carving are the words, first U.S. volunteer cavalry and below the line, Las Guasmos, San Juan, Santiago. On either side, the letters RR for Rough Riders. just 23 years old. I'm sorry, this isn't a better picture. I have never seen this, but this was photographed in 2017. So it seems as though it is still there. So they did raise the money for that. And this, I know this picture is cracked in three places and this is in the drawing room. This is the Miller family in 18, 90, but I, I felt like it kind of symbolized what happened to the Millers when they lost Theodore. I didn't tell you that, and I just learned, thanks to Alexander Reimer, author of Seduced by the Light, that the Millers had lost a child, their firstborn child, Eva, died after unexpectedly contracting pneumonia. So Theodore would not have been born, nor John, probably one or two others when she passed away. And uh, Alexander said that she was a golden child, a, si a shining star, somebody that was just an amazing person with great promise that they lost. Somehow this family kept on going, but then they lost Theodore in a war. And I will give you my personal opinion uh, that war going to war and this particular war seemed even more tragic than usual, that it really wasn't a war that needed to be fought. You may disagree with me, but that's how I feel. And he, so he lost his life. But this is what happened. I told you about his sister, Jenny Jane. Her, they, her name is Jane, but they call her Jenny. She was 42 and the second oldest. She had been in poor health. Three months after Theodore dies, she dies at the age of 42 from valvular heart troubles. Two months after Jenny died, Lewis Miller had to remain in bed. He was um, because he had such abdominal issues and maybe a little bit of a broken heart. Mina wanted him to go to New York for an operation. And this is what I knew. I knew that he passed away on his way there. But thanks to Alexandra's book, I found out that on his way to New York, the sleeping car on the train to New York broke down, leaving all the passengers on the train without heat. So they're spending overnight. They have sleeping cars in the train. There is no heat. It is brutally cold. The lack of heat made things worse, and he was chilled. The next day, he went by to the hospital by ambulance and underwent surgery, but Lewis Miller didn't survive the operation. It's a tragedy, and I just always felt like his heart must have been broken too, but that's just uh, my opinion. So they went through so much in just a few months. The service they have for Jenny is much uh, smaller. They just couldn't go through another service by that, like that. They had lost so much. The remaining children remained very close. Um. So I recommend a couple of things. That book that's called Theodore Miller, Rough Rider. It has his journal, his life story, his eulogies, um, letters from people that fought with him in the Spanish-American War. And in Seduced by the Light, there's a little section about Theodore as well, where I learned so much. So I highly recommend this book. It's a book about Mina Miller Edison. Next month, I hope you'll join uh, site historian Tim, lead historian Tim, 
for a step into history all aboard. The history of the railroad in Fort Myers. It's on August 2nd. I'm blocking this, I'm sorry, at 1030. And then next month, I'm going to be a week later because I'm going to be away. Please join me for on August 15th at 1030 for the digital discussion, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, defender of the Everglades. And you've heard her name in the great tragedy that happened at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas um, was so many things. Um, environmentalist worked so hard to save the Everglades, um, a suffragette, just many, many things. She's a woman you might not know a lot about, but you'll want to learn more about her. And she lives to be 108 years old. Here's some of my sources, the Ohio Memory Project, our, our TV station, uh, Edison National Park, Theodore Miller Rough Rider by Theodore Miller, edited by George Vincent, Seduced by the Light. And my last one didn't make it on, on here, but if you go to newspapers.com and articles in the Akron Beacon Journal. I, um, I hope you've come to admire Theodore excuse me as much as I do and I hope you'll join me next month I'm going to stop I have a question thank you Holly what a loss I agree a tragedy a shining star and it changed the course of the Miller family's life if nobody has any questions I'll see you next month. And thank you so much for joining me. And I apologize for my technical difficulty when it didn't seem like one of the things I had my uh, laptop plugged into was charging. Thank you. And I'll see you next. Oh, and I will see you next month.